Hello, everyone. This is Stephen with the Wood Somebody Testified podcast. Today, I have with the today I have Hannah Herrera with me. Great start. <laughs> How Hi, are everyone. You? I'm good. How are you? All right. So, where exactly do you want to start in this? Your, your childhood, or do you want to just skip to? Um. Yeah. So I can start off. I just want to start off first by saying thank you for having me on here and just a fair warning. I will probably cry quite a bit. <laughs> um, anybody who goes to church with me or has heard my testimony so far, that's kind of comes with it. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty emotional, but, uh, I've, I've been praying for this because, um, I feel like my testimony needs to be shared. So I kind of thought I would just start off. Um, I was raised Going to Souls Harbor, uh, Brother Anthony and Sister Rosemary were my pastors growing up. My parents were both from homes that, um, you know, lived in sin. And they, my mom got saved pretty young and they got married and I am the youngest of five. And so they raised us in church. We didn't miss services. I couldn't tell you of a time that I really missed any church growing up. We went to a Christian school. Um, our whole lives. We graduated from the Christian school as well, uh, continued on with, um, you know, church and, and that um, area of our lives. I'm sorry if I stutter, I'm nervous. <laughs> but um, so I had grown up, my dad was in the hospital and I was about 17, 18 years old when my dad had gone, um, had a few different things go wrong and he ended up being in the hospital for a couple months. He passed away on the second month to the day that he was there in the hospital. And during that time I had started kind of struggling with, um, I wasn't ever a kid who was really interested in sin or what it had to offer. I was very much sold out Christian as a young child and I got saved when I was seven but I had started uh, going into the workforce and I became a manager pretty quickly at the job that I had worked at and so I just picked up you know more shifts and I started working a lot more and um, I started missing you know services here and there not anything too extreme but that's how it usually starts um and so I had would miss, you know, a Sunday here or there in the morning or a Wednesday night. And, and then I became a supervisor and I started training people and I was just missing more and more. And then I gradually made friends, you know, at the job, people who weren't Christians or had that type of background or anything like that. So they had, you know, kind of started influencing my life and the way that I spoke and I seen you know, the things that they did and they seemed like good people too, you know, it wasn't, they weren't Christians, but they didn't seem to me like, you know, they were too bad of people. And so I started hanging out with them a lot outside of work, you know, and then I just slowly just drifted away from it. I didn't leave because I was, you know, angry at God or upset at the church people or um, anything like that. I had just allowed you know, a separation to kind of come into my life and pull me away from it. And then my, uh, my dad passed away and I was kind of just, you know, we, we moved in the middle of it. We were living out of town. We moved back into town in the middle of him being at the hospital. There was just kind of a lot going on in that time. And I ended up, you know, going out into the world, doing things I shouldn't. And I ended uh, pregnant about three to four months after my dad passed away. Um, and I had went into, you know, just a, a different lifestyle. I had drifted, you know, and um, I ended up having my children and moving in with the father. And I don't want to um, encourage anybody that sin is is fun as I talk about these things, I don't want anybody to get the idea that it's an easy life because it is not, or that it's fun or exciting or anything like that. Sin has a way of coming in and slowly destroying all that you know. And often 
times when you allow certain relationships and sin into your life, if you get the chance, and not everybody does, you deal with those consequences. Even in your Christian walk, you will, you know, step away from it, but you will have consequences of the choices that you've made, even in your walk with the Lord. Um, and so I um, just went around, just went about my lifestyle. Um, I moved to a different state for a while when my children were about 10 months old. I was there for a little less than a year. I came back. Um, I involved myself, you know, with other people, with different things, alcohol, um, drug use, different things, never with my children there. Um, they've never seen any of those things from me, but I had allowed those things into my life. And when you allow those kind of things into your life, you don't realize the hold that they that they take, that they can grasp. So I had kind of welcomed those things in and just they kind of took a position in my life that they should not have held or kind of a stronghold there that I didn't even realize that they had. Um, and I just continued to kind of live my life in sin. And, you know, I compared to, you know, other people didn't seem that bad or, you know, it didn't seem to like I was too far in and, um, I was just living that lifestyle. I hadn't, wasn't thinking about church. I wasn't thinking about, you know, coming back, but as a kid who grew up in church, you have all of these, you know, these songs and, the, you know, the Bible says that if you train up a child, you know, they won't depart from it. And oftentimes people whose children leave church, they think that that means, you know, you know, like they're going to come back or they, they don't depart from like they weren't supposed to leave, you know. And I actually think and I've had this conversation with a few other people, my pastor um, and his wife, my mom and my sister. And like, it can mean, you know, like when you grow and, and older and, you know, it doesn't leave you, you still have all of this knowledge that is with you, even if you choose to ignore it, or if you choose to, you know, attempt to forget about it or not involve it in your life, it is still there. It doesn't, it doesn't leave you. It's something that you've known for so long. And, um, so I, had hadn't had any intentions of coming back to the Lord. I would have moments where I would, you know, think, oh, maybe, you know, because I, I knew what I needed to do, but I wasn't doing it. Um, and then a few years ago, it's been almost, it's been almost three years now, actually. Um, that my sister Tony had passed away. She had um, gotten pregnant as well. She ended up catching COVID, at least this is what we thought uh, she had had at the time. And um, I can remember her coming to my house and laying um, in my bed and she was just sick and, you know, I, she wasn't feeling good. And we just thought it was because she was pregnant. You know, we didn't think too much into it um, as far as it being fatal or anything. You know, we we just thought it was, she was pregnant because <laughs> when I was pregnant, I was sick all the time. Um, but so she had, there was one morning she just was, she wanted to go to my mom's. She wasn't getting any better. And so she went to my mom's house and we were all there. And I can't remember. That was kind of a, a bleak time for us. Um, if it was like a couple days she had been there or how exactly long it was, she was in a bad situation with the man that was involved he just wasn't a good guy and so um she was at my mom's house and they I wasn't there I would think I was at work or something and she had felt like my mom they just seen her walking from the bathroom to the living room which is not very far and she sat down and she was just really winded there she couldn't really breathe so my mom and my sister realized something was going on and so they put her in a chair that we had and they wheeled her out to the car and they drove her to the hospital. And when they got to the hospital and they finally got her in and everything she had had, I think it was like 
eleven percent oxygen, which is <laughs> extremely nothing almost pretty much. Yeah. And um compared to what we're usually at, obviously. And um so she they rushed her to the hospital and she was there for oh just about two weeks and the, the people of God came from every everywhere it seemed. I mean is as soon as it happened, we were, it was also during COVID, so nobody could stay with her. You know, she was pretty much alone the whole time. And she would FaceTime me and ask me to sing her Christian songs. And, you know, I, I'd sing her songs, you know, so she could fall asleep if she could. Or And the people of God just filled my mom's home from Raisin City, um, Fresno, any churches that were surrounding the area, they were just there. And I was living in sin, but I knew, you know, I knew all of them. I'd grown up with all of them. And I can remember a time um, that Brother Denver had, and I've told this to a few different people that he had prayed. And it was as if, like, even as a sinner, you could feel like uh, the peace of God just kind of come into that room. And I believe that that was for my mother. Um, and so it had, you know, went on for a couple of weeks and she would, she, she was talking back and forth to different people. And um, there was a girl that she did not care for very much. <laughs> and she'll laugh when she hears this <laughs> because she knows who she is. And um, this is a silly situation that happened. And when you're a sinner, everything is, you know, a little different. And um, she, this girl had felt like reaching out to her and she reached out to her and she was able to lead um, in a way, Tony back to God. And um, Tony gave her life back over to God in those couple weeks. And I feel like God granted her mercy there that he didn't have to. And he later would grant me that same mercy in a different way. But he, um, she got saved and she was able to change that. And you could immediately tell in our text messages when it changed, when she had that change of heart. Um, and she was telling me, you know, Hannah, we, we've been, you know, we look like clowns all these years, you know, we know better and, you know, we've, we know what we've came from and we're here, you know, doing all of these things for no reason, you know? And, uh, I did, you know, I mean, I, I agreed with her, but I didn't think anything of it because when you're in sin and you're bound and you don't realize the, the chains that are there when you're, when it's just part of your everyday walk and it's just, you just get up and you've been dragging these chains around for so long. It's just kind of part of what you do and you don't think about it. And, <clears throat> I'm sorry. And you take them everywhere with you and, um, I didn't think anything about it. I, you know, I heard her out and, you know, I listened and then that was it. And I um, can remember telling somebody at the time that she wasn't going to make it. And, you know, they were like, oh, you know, don't say that, you know, that you don't know that. And I said, yes, I do. She's not going to make it. And it was like a day or two later that we got the phone call. Um that she had passed away. And it was extremely devastating to me. Tony was my best friend. She was the person I did everything with, the person I called for anything good or bad news. Uh, my daughter loves her. That was her, her best friend. They... As you know, when you have a little best friend, she's a child, but they were really close. And she was a part of really everything for me. And so it honestly, it shattered my whole world. I don't know how to explain it other than, than that. It was extremely rough. Um, and I can't even fathom now as a Christian how I did that as a sinner because I, it's still hard now. So I don't understand even how I was able to get through that. But um, I had went, I'm not somebody who 
has ever dealt with like depression or um, anxiety. So I've never been that type of person. I have a pretty bubbly um, personality most of the time, pretty goofy. <laughs> I just, that's just who I am. And uh, I hadn't gotten to a really, really extremely dark place after that and it was more than I had even realized um how dark it had went and I kind of just tried to uh void it out to void everything out that I was feeling I just worked and every day I would drink and every often I would do other things that I don't really want to go into detail of um, on that part, but I allowed sin to kind of control and take over the things that I was feeling so that I didn't have to feel them um, and just, just try to close out that pain. And um, I can remember going to a church service a couple Weeks after she passed away, no, it was longer than that. Um, she had passed away in November, and I went on Mother's Day the next year, so it was definitely a few months so after her passing. Um, Just a few. And I remember going to the service, and it was a Mother's Day service because I would always go to church on Mother's Day. I was gone for almost 11 years. I had walked away from God for that long. And um, I remember sitting in this service and there are people today at my church who got saved during that service. And I very much believe it was for them, but I also know that it was for me that day. And I did not choose to, I, I turned around in my pew and I prayed and I can remember sitting there. And at the time I have a friend who is now backslidden but at the time she was saved and I can remember her praying with me and I looked up at her and I told her, you know, I don't, I don't feel anything. No, I don't, I don't feel nothing. And she told me, you know, that's, we've done that to ourselves, you know, and I know that it, when you choose to be a Christian, it is not all about feeling. Most of it is not about feeling, but I know who I am as a person and I'll get into that a little bit. Um, and so I, it had bothered me that I didn't feel much, but I knew that it was directed at me and there was a tongues of interpretation as well. And if you're a kid who's grown up in church, you don't ignore those. Those are <laughs> services that even if it's not for you, it might be, <laughs> you know, cause it's a voice of the Lord. And, um, I remember um, you know, kind of just letting the service end. Other people had went up and prayed and I had left the service pretty much at the end. I don't believe I even talked to anybody. I think I kind of got up as the pastor was ending the prayer. I don't remember staying. Um, and I remember getting into my car and if you've ever been in Pinedale, it's not a very big area. It's just a small little neighborhood. And it took me a long time to get out of Pindo. I was terrified to go home and I was driving and I can remember getting to that main light, uh, Herndon and Blackstone. And I sat at that light and the light was green and I didn't go. <laughs> and I was sitting there contemplating turning around and, and I was telling myself, I need to, you know, I need to go back. And I didn't. And I am, I don't drive super slow. I, you know, I'm very comfortable driving in the Bay Area. Or I, I I enjoy driving. It doesn't scare me. And I can remember driving the entire way home in the slow lane because I was so afraid of not making it home. But I completely mm -hmm. ignored it. Um, I got home and I, um, you know, I felt like maybe, you know, maybe I can do it. Maybe I kind of got a little bit of a touch, but I just kind of ignored it. I think I... I didn't even go back to any services after that. Um, and I just let it go. I, I didn't listen to it or heed that. And if I would have, I'd be much further than I am right now. <laughs> but I'm still thankful for God reaching me later. But um, so I had that happened. And then a couple of years, I believe it's been almost 
three years now since that. Yeah, because Tony has been gone almost three years. Um, so in that time, I, you know, I was never really somebody who had gone out, but in those past couple of years, I, I started, you know, going out on the weekends with people out to, you know, different places, bars and clubs, whatever, um, you know, experiencing things and trying things to deal that pain and to, you know, not feel what I was feeling about my sister and relationships that I had had with friendships that I had had things just kept going wrong and people, you know, would steal from you or, you know, different things. They would cause different issues. And I was a horrible sinner, but I still had a sense of humanity. I still came from a background that gave me somewhat of a foundation that wasn't what others had. So I still had a a moral standard in some areas that I understood, you know, stealing from your friend isn't a good, you know, isn't a good friend or, you know, mm -hmm. doing things in front of children is, is still not acceptable. You know, you don't have to lose all sanity or, you know, all <laughs> any decency. You don't have to lose all of that. But um, I can remember doing, you know, all of these things and getting to such a place that I had, no hope. I had no, no joy, no, no happiness. I was just really unhappy. And I can remember, um, somebody from my church telling me probably a good year and a half ago now that she would pray that I would be miserable. <laughs> and I can remember as a sinner hearing that and being like, oh, well, that's not how you get, you know, somebody to come to church. Oh, that's not how, um, and I can remember just kind of being irritated by it. But that is what happened is I became absolutely 100% miserable. Um, and I, you know, would go and get, you know, drunk or whatever, where it would seem like it was okay, but it's not. You still wake up with the same problems. You still wake up with the same pain, you know, the same choices that you've made that lead you up to certain life sir you know they're still there when all of that is gone and you know um and so i can remember um literally the week before i got saved or a couple weeks before i got saved i had remember telling my mom and my sister and i probably made this comment a few times like i feel like i'm just paying bills on a planet that's spinning like that's pretty much just what i'm here for is just to pay bills and <laughs> how sad how empty of a life that that is that was Very. and um i had somebody had asked me this was about a week before i got saved because i wasn't i was i was miserable and but i and i knew the answer but i just didn't think about it all the time i didn't i, I wasn't planning on going back i guess i was Con not content because uh, nobody's content in misery, but I was so bound that I had I knew what was wrong and I and I was aware of that I was going to hell, but I was so chained by the ugliness that I had allowed in that I just wasn't doing anything about it. And um, somebody had asked me, you know, do you ever are you ever going to go back to church? Um, are you know do you ever plan on going back to church and and my answer to him was no nah, I'm good and that was that was my whole answer I had no explanation I just said no nah, I'm good and he laughed you know he thought it was funny and I was just like I didn't think anything about it I, you know I just went about my day and it was um Tuesday February 19th that I had, I was home by myself. My children were at my, at their dad's house and, um, I lived alone and, um, I was at home and I was just in bed and, uh, I was laying there just thinking about how just my life was nowhere, going nowhere. As a sinner, you don't have a goal that you're reaching for. You know, you're just kind of here if you don't believe it heaven or hell you know and even if and if you do it's even more of a you know what are you doing wake up 
Um, but I was laying there and I just felt so ugly. I, I, it was as if all of the darkness, all of the loneliness, all of the sadness that I had felt over the past years just weighed on me all in that moment. And I never felt so alone or, and it was misery just settling in. And um, I can remember praying. I just, I, at the time I was high and, uh, and I was just laying there and I started talking to God and I, you know, I told him, I, you know, I, I've known that I needed to talk to you, you know, and I, you know, you hear, you know, if you're not a Christian, you know, your prayers hit the roof or whatever, certain things. And I can remember telling God, I know that it's not about feeling, but I'm going to talk to you the way that I would talk to a friend or I'm going to talk to you as if you were right here in the room with me. And I told him, you made me. Um, I know that it's not all about feeling, and I know that you can't rely on feeling to sustain your Christianity because that is not going to do it. It has to be off of faith and belief and understanding. So I know that that is not that, and I try to never get caught up in feelings. Um, but I understand that I'm an emotional person, and I and I know who I am in those areas, and so I just talk to God. And I told him, you know, you know who I am. You created me and I need to feel something. I want to change, but I cannot do it. I had no control. I thought that I was in control, but I was not. I thought that I had the sin and the addiction and all of that by the grasp, but I didn't. Not at all. It had me. And I held down a job and I took care of my children and I always had food in my home. I had clothes on my back. I had a car. It wasn't like I was a homeless person or anything, but it could have gone that far. I could have, you know, gone an entirely different route because it does for some people. And um, I just called out to him right there and I prayed until I was sober. Um, and it was probably a few hours that I laid there just crying and and I told him everything that I had felt that I was angry about Tony and I'd never been somebody to be angry at God. I never blamed all of my things on God or anything like that. I was never somebody who was angry and I was so angry. I had so much just built up anger that I felt like bursting all of the time at anybody, I mean, <laughs> like even just simple things like road rage or, you know, whatever, like little things that seem so little. I was so upset all of the time. And um, I had called out to him and I had, by the time I woke up in the morning and, and I, and I genuinely felt a difference. Um, and I called my sister, Kristen, and I told her, Hey, you know, I, I want to go to church with you. Um, I work this Wednesday, but I for sure want to go with you Saturday night. And like my mind had was made up from that moment. Like when I prayed at home that night, my mind was, was made up. And so I had already had in my mind when I went to that service and I don't think <laughs> It mattered what they preached on that night. I, I was going down to pray. <laughs> it, it didn't matter. But um, I thought it was so beautiful because God, John Knapp was there. And John Knapp actually was the person who had preached in the service on Mother's Day when I had uh, prayed and didn't, you know, and I walked away from it. And he came that night <laughs> and uh, they joked about him, you know, him <laughs> be, that I had to go to Raisin and still hear him or whatever. <laughs> um, but I had seen him come in from, you know, a, a sinner's life and become who he is now married to Deanna and has a beautiful family. And um, he had came from, you know, a life of sin, too. And I think that God kind of just in every way in every detail of my salvation and my walk after it was 
his hand was entirely in everything. And there are a lot of things that have happened that only he would have known <laughs> and only he would have known I asked or, or what I, you know, kind of went through, or like I said, I didn't want to go into too much uh, detail about the sin that I had, you know, involved myself in, um, but it was ugly. And so I had, I was there at the service and I knew, you know, I was going up to pray and he preached on out of John three sixteen, which is one of the most, and I don't say basic in a bad way, but it is a verse that is universal. Everybody's heard John three sixteen, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I, when he preached that, like it, it almost just made me like laugh because I was like, man, I felt all of that love, like in that message, I I knew that God was letting me know that he loved me and that he died for my sins. And it was a verse I've heard my whole life and I've probably had it memorized my whole life. <laughs> um, but he used a verse out like that. And um, I went down to pray and I was praying and I, and I had already known that I was a Christian. I gave my life to God that, but I needed to go and, and actually, you know, be in the house of God and and that hunger to be there was there immediately for me. And I can remember, uh, I was in the second pew as the altars and then the pew and sister Tracy came over there and she was praying with me. And I, and I didn't know what to do. Like I, I was, I knew that I was saved and I felt all of this overwhelming sense of just peace and joy and everything that I had felt was gone. It was lifted off of me. It was like literal freedom. Like the chains had been broken and that's what he did. Like he broke those chains. I had traded them in for so long. I mean, I had carried them around for so long and I didn't even know what to do with what I felt, I, what I was feeling from the Lord. And it was like, you know, you asked, you said you wanted to feel something. Well, now you got too much to feel. <laughs> no way. And um, I, Sister Tracy looked at me and I said, I don't, you know, I kind of started talking to her a little bit about I didn't know what to do. And she said, well, let's just praise him. And she threw her hands up in the air. And I was like, all right. <laughs> so I threw my hands up in the air and uh, we were just praying, praising the Lord for everything he'd done. And it was an immediate, it wasn't like a a salvation that gradually, you know, you get saved and then you gradually do things. It was immediately for me. Um, as soon as I had prayed, I, I mean, I, I had thought all of these things, you know, as a, as a, somebody who comes out of the world, but came out of the background that I have, you know, I have two children and I'm not married, you know, I have all these tattoos and piercings and I've, you know, done all of these things. And I was so worried about, you know, I would have to change the way that I dressed or, you know, and and when you come from that lifestyle, you know, you my my thought was, oh, well, there's no way, you know, God's going to be that worried about a pair of pants if, you know, I'm coming from doing drugs or whatever, you know, you think that the sin that you lived in compared to, you know, what you're giving up. And and I, at first, you know, I, I had had those thoughts before I prayed, you know, what, you know, what am I going to do? I, you know, when I'm done praying, I'm still going to have two children and not be married, you know, those I'm still going to have a home with no, you know, I'm the leader in it or all of these things, you know, they, they don't drop off, you know, you know, drop off of you. If you become a Christian, you know, I thought it, you know, it's not a fairy tale. You still have to live, you know, regular life and everything that I was so worried about. Steven I almost called you Brian. <laughs> oh, that Steven. would have been oh, so hurtful. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> But of everything that I had thought, Stephen, that was going to be such a big deal or it wasn't even it was nothing because all of the little things that I brought with me, I brought them to God, who is so much bigger than anything that we could possibly even imagine. And um, I can remember going to Raisin and kind of going to Fresno, you know, different figuring out where I fit, you know, or, and, um, 
I was kind of unsure. You know, I my children had been going to Raisin a lot with my sister. And she had planted that foundation in there for them, you know, and uh, planted that seed. But I had grown up in Fresno, you know, and uh, I went kind of back and forth for probably a month, month or so. And I just knew um, it was as if I, I had told God, you know, I, I just need to know, you know, and, and, you know, people would tell me it doesn't matter what you choose. Everybody's going to, you know, we're just happy to have you back. Um, you know, or, but I knew that there was a, a, a victory in me choosing, me deciding through with the Lord's help to go to Fresno because that was a battle that the devil had thought that he won, not just with me, but many others. And I, and I needed the devil to know that he lost that war, that that was something that, you know, he, he, he thought he conquered and he thought he won and he thought, you know, and I had to come back with God and, and show him, you know, that, that no, like this, you lost this one, like he, you lost. And, um, mm -hmm. and I think in, in a way, you know, he, he kind of took that and ran with it for the first <laughs> couple months of me being saved. He was pretty upset. So just different things, you know, trying to persuade me or whatever. And a lot of people like to, you know, blame the devil, you know, and in fact, it was your own, blind choices and disregard for the truth and for God that you kind of, that you allowed these things and now they're, you know, you got to deal with it when you come back. Um, yeah. And it's not the devil's fault. You know, everything is, he's, he's, he's stupid <laughs> to put it uh, simple and he's an ugly evil, but there are some things that, you know, they were my choices and, uh, I didn't have to let him in the way that I did, you know? And, um, so I had, you know, started going to Fresno and just all of the things that I was so worried about just weren't even a problem. Like everything that God had, had did for me and just the grace that he showed me, it was as if like he had this blanket of grace over me and my children because and this is a conversation I just actually had with my sister was um, like I a lot of people will go out into the world and they will not have a chance to come back. Tony was granted a grace that God gave her. Um, she only had two weeks and God gave her grace and she made her soul right before she went to him. But I have family members who did not get that chance and who did not make it um and died uh you know in a short time after tony and uncles and you know different people who have passed away and didn't have that option and for god to give me that option to give me that choice and to not let me go for me is so astounding i i do not deserve the chance that he gave me at all and um i People will joke around and, you know, tell, are you sure you're not called to preach? You know, because <laughs> I get up and testify and I'm so excited. But I, I don't feel called to preach. And I said this at my church. But I do feel called to give my testimony because I have heard other people's testimonies that have touched me. And I hope that mine can do that for somebody else. Um, and if it doesn't, I'm still grateful for the opportunity to share it. But I just felt compelled to tell it because he he didn't have to grant me grace. And he not everybody gets that choice and you may not get it. Um, I had just thought, you know, I was reading, you know, different verses in the Bible. And after I became a Christian... Uh, verses that I have heard over and over, you know, over the years would just kind of pop out at me. And um, one of them was Second Corinthians, I believe it's 5 and 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. And I know that that verse, you hear it and we've heard it, you know, our whole lives, but it was as if uh, the understanding of what that meant 
became so real to me because I no longer think the way that I did in such a short time. I, my whole life has dramatically changed. My mind has, when I tell you, my mind has been renewed. Like things will be said and they sinful things that I've used to would hear and your mind automatically thinks a certain way. It doesn't even trigger that for me anymore. My parenting different. Every aspect of my life had changed so much in such a short time. And it was in some ways, it's so overwhelmingly like mesmerizing to me because six months ago, I was so lost and I was so hopeless and I had, I had nothing and I was going nowhere. And in that short of time, he was able to reach down and it was as if he literally put his hand into my heart and pulled everything that was in it out and filled it with just this resounding peace and and joy and happiness that I can't even explain to you because it doesn't even make sense to me half of the time and I, I'll wake up and I'm like wow like you know I'm a Christian, you know, and I'll, you know, you lose friendships and, you know, certain things, you go different ways and not because you don't love people, but because, you know, you now surround yourself with different things and different people. Um, And I remember when I had first got saved, I had uh, went to, we were on the way to church and my mom was like, I don't, uh, what did she say? She said, I don't know why, um, you know, I don't know if you did your makeup or something or what. She was like, but your face looks so clear to me. And I just remember looking at her and I was like, no, mama, that's peace. (laughs) And we Mm -hmm. started laughing, you know, because it was it was funny, but it really was it genuinely changed from the inside out. It wasn't something that, you know, just kind of, you know, made a little bit of a change. It genuinely changed my entire life, my future, everything that I want to do, the desires of my heart, the way that I work. Uh, I'm still late to everything because that's just who I am (laughs) as a person. (laughs) But but it changed everything drastically for me. Um, Even, and, and it sounds funny, but even the way that I whip my children in discipline, you know, just there is a a difference and an understanding of that I've got to make heaven now and I've got to take them with me now. It's not just, you know, it's not just me. And, um, I, I, again, I don't want sin to sound like it was fun and I don't want it to sound like, you know, you can get out, you know, you can get out of it because you might not be able to on, you definitely can't on your own, but with God, God is the only way that you know, people can get out of the bondage of sin. And I don't want it. And I hope nothing that I have said has made it sound appealing because sin has, it has clutches. It has, and everything that you welcome into your life and you let, you know, come into your life. Some of them, the things you you can't, you can't get out of. And I wasn't able to shake them on my own. I wasn't able to conquer any of the things that I had dealt with in my life alone, God literally had his hand covering me, covering my children, saving me from things that it could have gone a different way. You know, I was never abused. I was never, you know, I've heard other people's testimonies. My mind, I didn't lose my mind. You know, um, my children were never taken from me, different things. Um, I, I never had to face certain things. I didn't come back and, and I don't mean to sound like um, prideful or showy in this, but I didn't like lose the talent that God had given to me and he didn't have to. I never married. You know, I came back and there were certain things that God like rescued me from and saved me from and kept me from experiencing. Um, you know, I have all of these things that I, I now have the consequences of my choices but I have the redemption that God gave me and he, he didn't have to do that. And I'm so grateful for the chance that he gave me (laughs) because 
I don't know what I would do without it. I was so nervous to get on here and tell my testimony, <laughs> but I, I, I knew that I needed to. Um, and I'm, I'm just so grateful to be a Christian and I, it's the only way. <laughs> that's, that's all I can say is that this, this right here is it. This is, this is where you belong. And if I could tell anybody who's living in sin, who, who hears this or anybody you've ever been my friend or, or I know you and you're lost and you're bound by the sins, get out, get out of it because you may not ever have a chance again. And God can reach and he can save you. Even if you think that you're not reachable, he can just listen to his voice. Try to listen and, and come back. <laughs> Cause it's, oh, and I tell you, that's the most freeing thing I've ever done. It's the best choice I could have ever made was to live my, to change my life and give it back to God. And uh, I'm so grateful for the chance to do so. And I'm so grateful to Stephen for allowing me to come on here and, and cry. <laughs> I do have one, a couple of questions. Just to yeah. sort a couple of things out. Um, me being me, I did, did a little check. You said uh, February the 19th was a uh, Tuesday, or were you saying the week of February 19th? Um, I believe it was a Tuesday. I can, I believe it was a Tuesday night. I might be a little bit off, but it, it was February 19th. So if that's not a Tuesday, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it, it's okay. It happens when you're a little too literal and have a <laughs> habit of fact checking random facts. Are you looking at the time, at the date over there? <laughs> yeah, it's, it looks like the 19th was a Monday. Okay, so Monday night then. Well, it would have been Tuesday morning, actually, because it was well into Monday night and Tuesday morning that I prayed then. So technically it was both. <laughs> okay, and it, uh, on the subject of you praying, I, I assume when you say you prayed until you were sober, you mean... Um, no, so I when I started to pray, I was not sober, but I wanted to be. Um, I wasn't like using every day or nothing like that. It was just at the time I prayed, I was not sober. I, in my right mind and I, but I was, I can remember like wanting to be. And I, that's when I was like, God, I need out of it. I just want out of it. I don't want to feel this no more. I'm, I'm sick of it. And so I literally at that time was high and I had prayed all into the night until I was, when I was finished praying, I had, was completely sober. Um, have you ever heard Brother Lenny's testimony, how he had prayed and he came into the church um, and he was drunk off of tequila and yes. when he stopped praying, he was sober like that. <laughs> so it was the, that form, like where I started praying and I was not, and by the time I was done, I was sober and in my right mind. Okay, that's what I wanted to check is if you were saying you prayed so long that you were sober, but you mean yeah. you you <laughs> were sober. Yes. <laughs> okay. Does that and make just, sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then, uh, how old are the twins? They are seven. They will be eight in October. Um, October 18th. They'll be eight years old. Okay. So for those of you who don't know, she has a boy and a girl full and of it. They're energy. adorable. <laughs> they're what? What did you ask? I didn't ask. I just said they're full of energy. Oh, yeah. They have a lot of energy, <laughs> especially Jermaine. He's he's a handful, but they're they're great. <laughs> uh, you covered everything I want to talk about. So I guess this is the end. Thank you again right. for coming on. I appreciate you very much for having me. I'm sorry we, I couldn't get to it until now, but I appreciate you having me on, and uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. And for those of you listening, have a good rest of your day.